script in English because we have plenty of length in English, even though the public is mostly silent, I guess. But we will see. I, I think we stay with English and then we will see how it develops in the discussions. Funciona? Si. Okay. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's roundtable entitled Repair and Access Sustainable Practices in Existing Built Environments. My name is Maria Böhmer. I'm head of science at Istituto Svizzero in Rome and a bit also in Milan, from time to time also in Milan. First of all, I would like to thank House of Switzerland, namely Présence Suisse and its partners for kindly having invited us to collaborate and to co-organize this and the previous talk on architecture here. This is a wonderful occasion for us to enrich our existing program of events that we are having at our location here in Milan and to offer a glimpse into the very dynamic architecture scene um, in Switzerland. As you may know, Istituto Svizzero, the general mission is to bring art and science from Switzerland in dialogue with um, Italian partners. And regularly our public program in Rome and Milan also features talks on current topics and trends in architecture. For our event series called Swiss Talks, we are happy to collaborate on a regular basis with Casabella and its educational program for architects, and um, thereby providing a platform to experts from the architecture scene in Switzerland and Italy. The focus of tonight's discussion is the question of sustainable practices in architecture and building, and our panelists will bring different kinds of expertise on these topics to the table, linking history and present as well as theory and practice. The discussion will be mod moderated by Marion Elmer, who is sitting here at my left, and it's my pleasure to briefly introduce you, her to you. Marion Elmer studied social anthropology at the Un University of Zurich and history and theory of architecture at the ETH Zurich. As a freelance author, she writes about architecture with a focus on the Canton Ticino and about sustainable, climate-friendly building and living. Marian also edits books and magazines and moderates workshops and discussions as tonight. And before I leave the floor to Marion, who will kindly introduce our three panelists, I would like to thank our partners again for this collaboration, our panelists and moderator for having accepted our invitation and all the people who have worked in the background for the organization of this event. And last but not least, I would like to thank you, the audience, for having registered online or being with us in presence tonight. I wish you all a very nice evening, stimulating discussions, and thank you for your attention. Buonasera e benvenuti. Good evening and welcome to the round table. The title of tonight's event is Repair and Access, as Maria Böhmer already told you. And we will try to find answers to the question, how can current architectural theory, history and design implement the call for more sustainable approaches? With me at the round table are Daniela Mondini, professor of history and of art and architecture at the Accademia di Architettura in Mendrisio. She's an expert in the Roman Middle Ages and thus the author of many publications about historic buildings in Rome. In recent years, she also, she also coordinated the summer school, Rome Reuse Restoration, that was organized by the Academy in collaboration with the Faculty of Architecture at the Sapienza University of Rome. Welcome. <laughs> Nicola Braglieri is an architect and professor at the École Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne, where he directs, among others, the Atelier d'Architecture Alpine. He thus studies the language, the vernacular tradition, and the natural reuse of utility buildings. And we will hear from him today about this topic. Guido Brandi, to my right, completes our roundtable. He has his own architectural practice in Como and is a researcher at the Faculty of Architecture at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences. There, he researches the topics of circular architecture and reuse of building materials, 
and he's the co-editor of the publication Bauteile wiederverwenden, Reuse Building Elements, published in 2021. We will hear about this publication, this important publication later on. So, I need my clicker. Uh, I, ah, I see it here, sorry. <laughs> it's very comfortable. <laughs> yeah, it's really good. So, how can current architecture architectural theory, history, and design implement the call for more sustainable approaches. In light of the climate crisis and knowing that we have to take every measure to limit our carbon dioxide output, it seems fair to ask, why are there in Switzerland, but also in other Western countries, still so many be buildings demolished and built new? According to the Swiss Association of Engineers and Architects, the embodied energy contained in the supporting structure of a building is only amortized after 60 years. That said, 60 years. <laughs> that said, buildings are demolished and re rebuilt much sooner. So why do we not reuse more existing buildings or building elements? Why do so many architects and investors still see the re renovation or reuse of a building as an impediment rather than a resource? Are there too many standards and regulations? Are there financial reasons? Is it not sexy? 17 million tons of construction waste is produced in Switzerland every year, solely from demolishing and dismantling buildings. That's not counting the excavated material, which is an addi additional 57 million tons. Two-thirds of this waste of these 7 million tons is processed into re recycled building materials, but of the energy that was originally required to produce, the materials is lost in the process. The materials is downcycled instead of upcycled. Oh, went back. Oh, the other slide. Yeah, 17 million tons. I was trying to find out how many elephants this would be. <laughs> it would be um, 7,000 7, elephants, 17 million tons. It's, it's, it's hard to imagine how much it is. <laughs> that, that much. Fortunately, the building industry is starting to rethink also to, thanks to new building methods, new materials, thanks to more information and good examples, in Switzerland, for many years now, almost all universities, ha or universities have been researching new building methods and new materials that need less energy in construction. And all the architectural magazines regularly publish content about climate-neutral building, giving pointers to the professionals on how to proceed. I brought a little example, edited by Edition Hochbarter, Klimabaun, it is also available in English, um, has been made uh, available in English. And Hochbarter, the same magazine, even pledged they would only dis uh, critic and discuss uh, architectural projects that take the climate factor into account. And they stuck to their pledge. The Leading Swiss Association for Engineers and Architects only two years ago published a paper Climate Protection, Climate Adaption and Energy and reissued the leaflet Embodied Energy from Buildings. And we have a young generation of architects that founded the Association Countdown 2030, which aims to raise more awareness. So all this Factors help, of course, today the profession knows better where the most leverage in climate-friendly construction lies. Reuse the excavated earth, keep the supporting structure, co convert existing buildings, reuse building elements, use climate-friendly material. And we can see the first promising projects in Switzerland, for instance, the Warmbachli House in Bern, where the architects won a competition by suggesting the conversion of a former chocolate production warehouse into a residential building. After finishing the projects, the architects found that the reused building 
has an incomparable and amazing spatial diversity that one couldn't have built from scratch. And of course, the lighthouse project everyone in Switzerland has been talking about over the last few years, the project uh, K118 in Winterthur, where Baubüro in situ, an architectural office from Basel, put a three-story building on top of an existing hall. And we'll hear about this project later on from Guido Brandi. But it's not only professionals, but also the public who have become more receptive to the climate-friendly building. An interesting story arose in Zurich uh, for a project of a, on an industrial plot. The winners of the project, the French office Lacaton and Vassal, proposed converting and adding stories to a culturally used factory hall instead of demolishing them. But the client assessed it as too risky, too risky under construction law and preferred a project where everything is destroyed and built anew. Since then, there has been a massive resistance from the population and from various organizations against this outdated way of creating buildings. And in the Neue Zürcher Zeitung, one of Switzerland's more important papers, the Pritzker Prize winner, Anne Lacaton, explained what it means for her to build with the existing. She said, the existing environment is extremely important for us. We don't see it as a problem, but as a foundation and as a resource on which we base our project. What is available is almost never at the end of its useful life. It could be used for a long time if you look at it without prejudice. So I think this is a very important quote, quote to, to remember. Uh, Anne Lacaton says we should look at the existing as a foundation, as a resource, without prejudice. But tonight we have here our historic expert. We could also turn to hist history and ask what concepts do we already know? Because reusing and Converse, converting uh, buildings is not a new concept. There's a lot of examples in Rome and in the history of architecture, and so I give you the floor, Daniela Mondini. Thank you very much. Hello to everybody. Buonasera. I'm also going to speak in English. This was a rule, and uh, I hope to, you will understand me. Uh, I'm talking to you from a perspective of a medievalist whose research focuses on the city of Rome. My question is, and continues to be, what happened with the built mass of ancient Rome in the post-antique centuries? The aspect, oh, now I have to go, yeah, okay, maybe I can. Uh, the aspect I intend to reflect on is the re-employment and sui generis ways of reuse of ancient buildings or elements of them in late antique and medieval times. But I think there will be some bridges also to contemporary. Intentional and integral conservation as well as restoration are modern attitudes towards the existing. However, it must be said that legal protection measures are already known from late antiquity. For example, at the end of the fourth century, under Theodosius, with the elevation of the Christian faith to state religion and the consequent closure of pagan, pagan temples, edicts were issued forbidding the destruction of works of art preserved in temples. At the same time, we know and this is confirmed by the discovery of, of tile stamps from the 6th century, that Theodoric had the imperial palaces on the Palatine restored, or better, repaired, to take up residence there. Generally speaking, we can say that Christian religious building in Rome have in some way functioned as environments for the preservation of ancient building materials, reemployed there. The long duration of the function has preserved them more easily 
and the reused Roman material is still visible and appreciable today. While the first early Christian basilicas of Constantine's time, thanks to imperial funding, were built ex novo with the use of building materials from the imperial warehouses, from the fifth century on, the reuse of spolia from ancient pagan buildings, secular and religious, this is also ecology, to have it also on the back. The construction of churches became characteristic. Spolium, spolia, is a Latin term coined around 1500 for building elements removed from ancient context and placed in a new one. In ancient military context, spoliare means strip the armor and arms from a defeated enemy, a trophy. A striking example is the Basilica of Santa, Santa Sabina, built on the Aventine around 430. The building reused portions of machinery from a private domus existing under the church. For its 24 fluted columns of Precomnesian marble with beautiful Corinthian capitals from the late second century, Brandenburg assumes that also these elements were, not, were never put in place, but were taken from a stock of imperial warehouse. On the contrary, Richard Krautheimer and other scholars assume that, that the prestigious second century building was dismantled and its precious building material was acquired for the construction of the basilica. It, it is not our task now to clarify the provenance of the architectural elements reused in Santa Sabina. What is interesting, however, is that in the fifth century, old material of over 150 years was used to build a Christian church. For the city of Rome, the use of spolia for the construction of basilica was to become practically the rule until the late uh, Middle Ages. Let's have a look at some spolia of the colonnade of San Lorenzo Fuori le Mura, built in the late sixth century. The beautiful trophy capital with uh, victories on the sides, second half of the second century, with, uh, which together with its counterpart adorns the foremost pair of columns near the altar, was probably chosen for this privileged place because of its symbolism of, symbolism of triumph. In the entablature, you can see how the workpieces dismantled from different contexts were creatively joined together with, without the intention of hiding their heterogeneity. On the left, you see a fragment of an architrave, and on the right, a vertical jamb from a door frame. However, the pragmatic search for long marble beams was still guided by an aesthetic demand to display precious sculpted reliefs. This kind of assemblage could also be called a collage, maybe? I think this, these terms are coming back. Alongside the dismantling of disused representative buildings in order to construct Christian uh, places of worship, reuse of building materials, polia, we also find the reuse of entire buildings. Christianity arrived on the Forum Romanum very late. It was not until the beginning of the sixth century that Christian places of worship began to be built in the heart of pagan Rome. These were the years in which Rome entered the political and artistic sphere of Constantinople dominated by the great emperor Justinian. The church of St. Cosmas and Damian, dedicated to the two medical saints who did not ask to be paid for their services, is the first church constructed of, on the Roman Forum. In fact, St. Cosmas and Damian was not built ex novo, but was inserted into an abandoned building belonging to the Forum Pacis, a medical center of Rome. This is a case of reuse, we might say today, of a public building. 
the own, only the apse with the beautiful mosaic was created ex novo. The circular building, the so-called so Temple of Romulus, dating back to the 4th century, built directly on the Via Sacra, was reused here as a simple vestibule for the church. So not for the church itself, but just the, the end, at the entrance. Uh, it was not until the beginning of the 7th century, in 609, 200 years after the closure of the pagan temples, that the last taboo was broken, when the pagan temple of the Pantheon, dedicated to all gods, was converted into a church dedicated to the Virgin and all the martyrs, Santa Maria Martyrs, also Santa Maria Rotunda, so all gods, all martyrs. We have a continuity. So far, we have talked about the reemployment of architectural elements or entire ancient building in late antique and early medieval structure. However, we must realize that the imposing ruins of, of the city of Rome were also reused as fortified dwelling places. The Flemish painter Martin uh, Hemskerk, in his sketchbook, gives us a striking view of the imperial dwellings on the Palatine. In the foreground, we see the remains of the Septonium, an imposing multi-storied columned representative, build representative building built by Septimus Severus on the southern slopes of the Palatine. It stood near to, uh, to the Circus Maximus. In the central Middle Ages, we know that the remains of the Septitionium served as fortress. The monks of the nearby Benedictine monastery of St. Gregory the Great took refuge, refuge there in 975 during the anti-imperial revolt against Otto II. In 1084, the Septitionium was defended against Henry IV, always the, the emperor, German emperor is, is a problem. And in 1117, it served as a refuge for pa Pope Pascal II when Emperor Henry V descended against Rome. Interesting is the motto that the Flemish draughtsman gives to this drawing. Roma quanto fuit ipsa ruina docet. How great Rome was, it, is all, it also shows us in its state of ruin. We, he notes these words right in front of the ruins of the Septizonio, whose architecture was much appreciated by 16th century architects and artists. We can recognize traces of the medieval reuse as well. You see maybe the little, the little apse, maybe the part of an oratory, and you see that the intercolumns were walled up um, and you see also little little windows, maybe. They should be assigned, maybe. So it looks a little bit rather improvised, and uh, they could be assigned to the category of bricolage. This is <laughs> to you. <laughs> this building, partly preserved and documented by several draftsmen, was demolo demolished by the Ticinese architect Domenico Fontana under Pope Sixtus V in 1588. Archival sources, the bill from the Carettiere Giovanni Pietro, gives us an insight how the process of dismantling and the logistic went on. The materials recovered there, columns, pepperine, and travertine stones, stones were all measured and at interim stored along the roadside and in the surroundings during several months to be used for the different construction sites of the Pope. His 16th chapel at Santa Maria Maggiore, but also a lavatory for the wool industry at the bath of Diocletian at Termini, for which 200 cartloads with piperino stones were transferred from the Septimonium to Termini. One caretata is 3,000 libre, 
more of one, uh, than one ton. So, Christine Papelau has described this, this deconstructive process as a rational, economical, and utilitarian practice. Of course, we are not talking about CO2 reduction, but resources as manpower, material, and time were an important issue also then. Uh, as is well known, ancient Rome served as a huge quarry for the building activity of the popes of the Renaissance and Baroque. In the Middle Ages, large structures were not so much de demolished as adapted and used as a whole. Among the most spectacular fortification is the fortress of the Pier Leoni and later the Savelli family, which from around the middle of the 13th century settled in the theater of Marcellus, built in the time of Augustus for 15,000 spectators. In 1535, Baldassare Peruzzi adapted it to a prestigious residence. In 1926 to 32, Mussolini, in Mussolini time, the building was partially restored to its original ancient design by demolishing the surrounding buildings. We can call, talk about the Restauro di Liberazione. The arches were reopened while retaining the upper floors, floors redesigned by Baldassare Peruzzi in the 16th century century. In his hybrid nature as an archaeologically remodeled historical monument, it bears witness of two epochs, antiquity and renaissance, not no, no mi middle ages anymore, that have never coexisted in disguise. Uh, this veduta of the Marcellus Theater shows us vividly the increase in street level since the time of Augustus. In an important study, Francesco Guidobaldi showed how in the first decades of the 12th century, the street level was artificially raised by about two to four meters. This urbanistic intervention took place mainly in the depressed areas, in the valleys, raising the street level to approximately the current one and reducing the topographical difference of the ancient city. It may have served to improve the viability, especially on the processional itiner itineraries between St. Peter and the Lateran. The rows may the roads may have been affected by the many ruined buildings that were semi-destroyed by age and lime extraction. Yes, next one. Ah, huh? uh, yeah, uh, I'm coming to the, the end. Uh, but only one thing. No, that, that is it. Okay. Ah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Doch. It, 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 yeah. Thank you. Um, Lime extraction. The centuries-old lime industry, Kalkbrennen, Cottura del Cal del Calcare, in Rome could be described under the heading of uh, metabolization of ancient building substance. San Clemente. In the depressed areas, dozens of church and dwellings had to be abandoned and rebuilt at a higher level as the well-studied case of the Basilica of San Clemente shows. There was absolutely no lack of materia prima for those new buildings. Ancient bricks, columns, capitals, and slabs of colors of marbles, which could be obtained on the, stop, on the spot. The burying of uh, entire basilicas without even recovering the columns shafts is an indicator of the oversupply of reused material in Rome. So you see here in the uh, early Christian basilica still the shafts of the columns uh, which were not uh, reused. Ah, here. I'm coming to the end. Yes. Okay. 
At the beginning of the 12th century, the city of Rome experienced a huge building boom with the emergence of the art of the cosmati, experts in collecting and upcycling of ancient spoliated materials, and marbles in special. It might have been encouraged by an oversupply of construction material combined with economic prosperity and the spiritual renewal movement of the church. And I finish here. Here, not a little bit of bibliography. Uh, many, many books are published on the line of the recycling of uh, building material from ancient times to now. <laughs> Thank you, Daniela Mondini. Did I understand correctly that on one point uh, it was symbolic and aesthetic values, but also you also mentioned that uh, manpower, time uh, was an issue to, to, uh, to, do, to reuse? Yes, uh, as, uh, so to have uh, this material on spot is very comfortable because uh, you have not to, to do this uh, transporti with, uh, you have seen the, the carrot. <laughs> and uh, time is also interesting. That means many, many people working because they have no machine mm -hmm. and uh, they have also a little bit to be paid. Mm -hmm. We okay. have no slaves at this time. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your inspirational input. We should learn from this. But first, we will hear from Nicola Braghieri. Uh, I'm very excited to hear from you. I don't know what exactly you prepared. I just saw the nice slides in, your, um, preliminar in our preliminary talk. You told me that there were 200,000 empty sheds in the canton of Valle. So they're empty, not used anymore. So um, what are we going to do with this? So I'm happy to hear from you, and we are going to see some of these sheds uh, in the slideshow behind us. I give no. you the floor. Thank you very much. No, first of all, thank you very much for your invitation in my city of Milan. It's quite exotic to be here to speak English, but that's okay. That's part of the play, of the game. <laughs> and, and so, um, yes, I, I prepared a, a slideshow. Um, the sec this one is the only one show with a phrase, with a sentence, that maybe it's really important to understand my, my speech. Uh, f uh, to avoid any misunderstanding, I have to give you some personal and some, a couple of autobiographic notes. I would like to show you some of my, my work, some uh, work of repair, but I didn't find photograph. Um, so uh, my cars, a couple of cars that I repaired in the past year that perfectly explain my idea of repair, maintenance, and reuse. My house, my home, and not least a real original Frankfurter Kuche that I bought some, some month ago in Germany. And I tried to import in Switzerland. I import uh, night time in Switzerland. And now I'm restoring uh, in the Alps in the Swiss Alps. Oh, I have always been fascinated by the concept of repair in all of its uh, variation, in all of meanings, and uh, so both practical uh, and affective. Over the years, I turned repair into existential practice and I think also lifestyle that permeates every of my action, reaction, Passion and concern too. When I was a child, I wanted to be a mechanic. I gave a lecture in Casabella Laboratory some years ago about this question. Those who know me know that perfectly. I spend all my free time looking for spare parts for the thousands of objects I have accumulated waiting to be refurbished. Uh, most of them probably never be refurbished and remain here. My house is largely built by salvaging salt construction elements and that it's not exactly following the criteria of uh, uh, sustainability. My jumpers and trousers are rigorously patched, this evening not. Um, I do 20 kilometers a day on 
a bicycle of the 60s, from the 60s. I don't iron or have anything ironed to dissimulate the crease I wear a tie. I haven't been to the hairdresser for several year, years, probably from the time that uh, Mattarella said, Giovanni, please cut me the ears. <laughs> so five years ago. Sure, I have other consumerist vices, vizi consumistici, but I don't think you're interested on in my vice. The photos scrolling on the background are photos I have taken crossing the Alps over the past few years. And they show how much the concept of repair, but above all the continuous maintenance and adaptation are intrinsic, intrinsic part of the Alpine material culture. I was kindly asked to structure my talk on vernacular architecture. I will be a discourse of pictures Discorso per immagini, to which I will return with words very willingly during the debate to follow. I don't want to enter in theory of vernacular architecture because probably there are no words to explain perfectly that. Good, fine. The first important thing is to define what are we talking about. The announcement of this round table contains a number of words tending to be binomials with strong phonetic effect and dubious semantic legitimacy. I'm so skeptic, which we all tend to misuse and which have built one of the great, the grand narrative of the times we are living in. Climate change, planetary caring, environmental and emotional ecosystem, building moratorium, resource intensive practices, exhaustion and appropriation mineral wealth, I read too, of course, sustainable approaches. All of these words are increasingly linked, more or less appropriately, to other global issues, from decolonization to the fight against patriarchal society. You all know very well what I'm talking about. But now I would like to reflect around the concept of sustainability and its implication in the extensive practi practice of repair. The etymology, it's clear, no doubt from re, again in English, and parare, make ready, prepare. Again, prepare, so reuse for another adventure. The adjective sustainable is associated with the term of development and the concept of durability and maintenance, probably more appropriate. The real question, I think, is posed by tonight's title of rather half of tonight's title, repair. I don't understand exactly what means access. I thought that was a, a, a software, but <laughs> even the term of development is today being challenged, calling into question the intellectual and behavioral roots of modern culture. And I'm not talking about Western culture, I hate it this way, but human culture in the broadest sense. Our modern cultural system was structured on positivist concept for which scientific, industrial, economic advancement was closely linked to well-being and values such as democracy and equality. Democracy and equality means development in our roots. Just as we do not have nothing, the right to impose the value system born of the Enlightenment, la Revolution Francese, l'Illuminism, and on anyone who has not actively and consciously contributed to its establishment, we cannot think of prescinding from it. Consumerism. Consumer is as a cornerstone of modern economic development, at least since the destruction of the wall of Jericho. It's the first consumerist act. Consumerism does not involve and concern repair, savasandir. Today, it seems impossible just to think that the great modern narrative was founded on the principle of the widespread, the diffuse consumerism is equivalent to the distribution of wealth. The forced industrialization is a pillar, not only of liberation from the slavery of labor, but also of gender emancipation, social progress, and workers' right to physical and psychologist health. Architecture has played and plays today a primary role in every experiment of social engineering. Utopia is simply the urban specialization of a socioeconomic project. Human beings have strongly believed 
in the weakness, the villainy, la cattiveria, of the state of nature, in which the god sauvage is eaten by the lion, even before being enslaved by his more muscular neighbor. The state of nature is cruel, and no, no moral law, no ethic law, no ethical behavior, no principle of equality of solidarity. Parity does not exist in nature. The adjective sustainable raises another question today, sustainable for whom? The question arises dramatically when one associates it with the world increasing divided into two or three developed country, developing a country and underdeveloped country, today better to say differently developed countries. The issue is dramatically practical. Today, developed countries continue to consume a disproportionate amount of raw material to satisfy the needs for domestic growth. Intensely developing countries are following the same path, but with less conscience. Our standard of living and social stability is guaranteed by a global market and consumering. We do not forget that. But the problem is, of course, even bigger. It, it's immense. How do we imagine stopping the race of those who aspire to have a world similar to ours? Especially when our alternative model demands a sacrifice, even for those who have so far guaranteed the benefits to others. It asked us. Ecological, sustainable, green architecture is clearly not an invention of recent years. It has always been a primary concern, starting from three days of the ancient time. So primarily that, as it should be, it is naturally and obvious. Today a new grand narrative, I come back with the question of narrative, the ecological narrative, along with others we debate every day, had replaced the modern ones, including that of human progress took faith in science and social control. There is also the paradox. The paradox that thanks to technological progress and the free market, we know now have the tools to build more sustainable, thanks to the consumering, than in the past. But I know this is a relative question, therefore scientifically incons inconsistent. I repeat, sustainable for whom? Sustainable according to what standard? Our standard, their standard? At the moment, the positive model of development in its most varied declin declination from liberal to socialist is the only practiced model of development capable of satisfying or pretending to satisfy the world's aspiration. Liberalism or socialism, there are no alternative. It is unrealistic to imagine asking for sacrifice, exception to happiness, hypothecation of wealth, breaks on aspiration from those who wish to have what others have and perhaps even possess the resource. We depredate the resource to people that we ask to not have our uh, way of life. It is a question of realism. I propose a rhetorical question to you. Why should we prevent those who live in a prefabricated contract social block housing, a Plattenbau, from being able to aspire to live in a villa with a swimming pool? It is obvious that this is a provocation and that it is the market that finds the solution at the end. But it is the same market that drives the desire for the villa with the swimming pools in uh, banana forms and thus drives away sensitivity to reducing land consumption. In recent decades, the economic system seems to have been guaranteed rather than by consumption, by waste. It's guaranteed by waste. The immediate wear and tear of every good has been the most effective development resource of a genetically modified capitalist system. Every tool seems to have been designed to have an expiry date at which it must be replaced without alternative. Replaced, not fixed. From a consumerist perspective, not repairing always pays off, unfortunately. Similarly, similarly the architecture of glossy magazine looks perfect, but when it breaks down, no one can repair it. 
but it's banal. There are no more splintered bricks to refurbish, rotten beams to replace, windows frames to repaint, chairs to stuff. Instead, there are glittering wrecks to take to the dumps. Maintenance is labor, and labor is not sustainable in an economic uh, system governed by intensive consumption, consumerism of industrial produce, produced goods. The role model of every op opulent society inevitably becomes ostentation. Only a thin minority, minority of amateur and connoisseur conceive austerity as a positive quality, particularly in architecture and industrial design. In today's mass society, recycling and maintenance are the preserve of a few cultural, cultural elites of a few minorities who have the financial means to afford such a luxury. Recycled paper is like black bread, once for servants, today for masters. The same for an old house. Sustainable development and eco-friendly consumption appears to be binomial in which an alternative vision of the world is mixed, as just as presumptuous and indifferent on the actual state of pressing emergency. The reference models of the large market are products with the strong and direct message, able to unscrupulously communicate the achievement of a relative economic well-being. Architects have adapted the behavior well to the custom of the customer market, where needs are immediately translated into caprice. Caprice become works of art. Works of art turn into money. Money, money induce new needs. It's a circular economy. Architecture can, can no longer translate the needs of life into the form of arts. Today, artistic expression is translated into an object of fast consumption, functional to a system which weak ethics and unconsistent moral. Architecture is a celebration of itself and a mirror of the individual success of its creator. A new austerity in my time, we spoke of sobriety, Tanita Tikaram, song a song with a new sobriety. I don't think it will become fashionable. Either institution will impose it on us, or nature will impose it on us. The only other possibility to come back and hope in the old modern grand narrative, science will find a solution sooner or later, whatever the cost. So far, it always worked out well for us. Not so pessimist, eh? Thank you very much for your eloquent and on-the-point speech about uh, our consumerism. You had a lot of quotes that I will, will keep in mind. Uh, sustainable for whom? Not so, uh, repairing is not financially sustainable. <laughs> That's very, <laughs> a very good sentence. Thank you very much. Um, you said science might bring the solution. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> you ready? <laughs> no. No, actually, we don't yeah. this. <laughs> thank you, Marion. So, first of all, thank you for having me here and to invite me. And buonasera a tutti. Um, yeah, now I'm actually overwhelmed by all the, <laughs> the speech from Nicola, um, and of course, also from all the example of uh, Daniela about spolia. And you, you see how, yeah, everything has already been done somehow. And so now, for me, it's a bit strange because I'm going to explain you just, uh, I'll show you a case study, just a building, that we have the, um, the possibility to, to uh, study and analyze in, uh, in our school of ZHV, uh, in our Department of Architecture in, uh, uh, in Winterthur. So uh, I'll talk about our research about uh, reuse of building components as a part of circular architecture. And this uh, research we are doing since uh, three or four years actually would have, wouldn't have been possible without this case study. This Kahn uh, under Axen, I have to tell it in, English, in German, I cannot uh, tell it another way. So this building 
planned and from uh, Balburo in situ. And so maybe, ah, yes, it's here, thanks. Uh, so this is how I tell you a bit the story of this building and so how everything started. So here we are in, uh, in Winterthur and uh, the, the thing was that actually our school, our university school is just 200 meters away from this building. And uh, three years ago, the director of the, uh, our Institute of Constructive uh, Design, Astrid Stauffer, had the possibility to be in contact with uh, Barbara Buser, that she's the, um, the founder of a Bauburo in situ. And if you maybe not know her, so Barbara Buser, she's the real pioneer in Switzerland for the reuse of building components. In 1996, I think she founded uh, an association in Basel called Bautel Borse that uh, became really successful and she founded with Clara Kloiser. And this association is, uh, is basically a shop using the word, uh, work of unemployed people to go collecting around, so in, uh, in uh, demolition site, but also in houses to collect uh, building elements, but also houses, appliances, uh, sink, taps, every kind of uh, material, but also tiles and uh, to repair them, uh, put it again uh, on work, and sell it them again. And this thing was really successful, that actually, so it grows up, and now almost every city in Switzerland has a, has a Bautile Borse, at least in the north part of Switzerland. I don't know if in Ticino there are some. Um, and uh, it's interesting to see, because uh, we are in this industry area called Sulzer Areal, and this part, the area was the own, is owned by uh, Stiftung Abendroth, that is actually a, so a foundation, and Abendroth is a pension fund, a Swiss pension fund. And the manager uh, of the development for the real estate for Stiftung Abendroth was, again, five years ago, Clara Kloiser, the, the friend of Barbara Buser, that they uh, found together the Bautel Borse. So, Somehow, this is a bit the story of the building to let you understand why some, we, we had the possibility to study such a um, case study, uh, because of course this was the perfect match. So the idea was uh, for um, Foundation Abendroth to say, okay, we manage this industrial area, we don't want to uh, develop it, demolishing and uh, exploit it, but we, we decide more to preserve the area, to maintain the current industrial character. And uh, the idea was to, on this uh, precise building, to make just this uh, three-floor addition. But also, so the challenge was to say, because Barbara Buser and Barbara in situ, in, they were involved, to say, okay, but we try to reuse 100% of every possible material. But the, the, the building has to cost, let's say, almost the same as a new, a new normal building, and this was the challenge. And uh, we had the chance, as uh, being two me 200 meters away, to follow this uh, this project from the beginning till uh, till the end with the direct the other director of the institute, Andrea Sanderegger, and me and Eva Stricker as uh, a fellow researcher. And so this is a, a photo of the. Um, the entrance of this areal, when you see on the back, the Ausstockung, the, the, the three floors uh, addition. Um, so as I said, we had the, the chance to, to follow from the beginning to the end this project, and all the result of this uh, case study is this book that we published uh, last year in autumn, and uh, it's going to come out also this autumn in October in English. Um, and um, I will just briefly explain, uh, uh, because it's kind of a really dense book, we wanted to put all the data, all the information, all the findings we found out with this case study, because it's somehow it's rare to have such a precise uh, project to, to study, because um, you have to imagine, I will explain later, this building really tried to use every possible reused material, even the entire steel structure was reused. And, uh, so we, 
We divide this book in even four different uh, text categories. So we had uh, a kind of a reportage, more explaining more journalistic, how so there are some anecdotes, uh, anecdotes on how the the build the, the the process of the building. Then we have some essays explaining with 25, uh, s let's say, ar reference project, architectural project from the past and from the present. Uh, uh, what can be, w which kind of approach we we have for this uh, circular architecture or re the reuse of building elements and uh, approach or strategies. Then we have interviews, so where we try to yeah to be in contact with all the stakeholders that are uh, that work with the reuse building elements. So architects, but also clients, but also officials of the city that they have to plan and think about uh, sustainability and um, also with the legal uh, so uh, legal officer officers because this um, work with re reuse material is really it changed the way how you have to plan a project the process is nothing new because in the end listening to uh, Mondini so the, the things that the when in the moment that they have to to plan to re, uh, so this, disassemble the stones and to calculate how much time you need to put on the carretto and move them, there is where the same problems that Barbaro in situ had in this project in the end. Uh, they were just not stone, but they were st steel beams, but in the end were the same things. And so the last part of the book then is this uh, infographic and uh, where we tried to with so visualization uh, diagrams, axonometries, to to explain all the data, all the findings we found out. And so I will try to explain you the this building using those graphics because, of course, it would be much better to have Barbaro in situ here explaining you directly uh, the project. I'm not. I'm just the one that analyzes it. Um, and so this exploded axonometry shows you. Uh, the project and uh, we use this uh, color code uh, from the beginning of the book to say everything that is reused is, uh, is in green and as you can see almost every visible uh, element in this building is green so it's reused so the, the steel structure even the facade every windows is reused the solar panel on tops the, the isolation of the roof uh, the, the entire staircase on the side, the balconies. Um, and this was pretty uh, amazing to see something like this because you have to think about that uh, is n there are many examples of pavilions, maybe disassembled, reassembled somewhere else, uh, something temporary. But this is a building that should uh, stay for a lot of years, following all the Swiss norms in terms of uh, fire protection, uh, um, earthquakes, uh, and uh, noise isolation. And so it was almost done with everything reused. But, there is a but, let's say. Uh, ah, this is the, yeah, I <laughs> forgot that I put also some, the, the image, so you see the, um, the facade and the um, vertical, the, so the outside staircase. And this is also an image from the inside, where you can see how it looks like. And of course, yeah, it's interesting to see how there is this kind of, uh, it's reused, really, it's not new. So the, the parquet was uh, <laughs> taken from uh, another housing project uh, 10 kilometers away. I think actually in this image, the only thing that is new are the, this wooden element on top and the one framing the windows. All the other things, even the electrical appliances, are reused. The radiator, everything is reused. Um, but there is a but, uh, or at least, uh, or, or at least we start with some data. It was interesting uh, to find out. I think it's always one of the most striking uh, um, uh, diagram. This one. So if we consider another parameter to 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 understand how much of the building is reused. Because of course, the starting point for in situ was 100% has to be reused. But in which, which parameter we are speaking about? If we watch the weight parameter, this is a really sad uh, result somehow, 
just 14% of the building components are reused. But this also gives us already a, a finding, so because actually to work with reused materials means to work with light construction. Even a steel structure is lighter than a concrete structure. Or working with light facades and uh, light elements because they are easier to be dismantled, easy to uh, transported, easy to storage and to re reinstall uh, somewhere else. This was the main finding of it. And we see that all, actually if it's not visible, the concrete play always a big role. And uh, almost 43%, and we cannot avoid it. Also, we don't see it so much because, uh, because of foundation, because of earthquake norms, because of uh, um, fire, uh, fire protection. For example, in this building, till the end, Barbara in situ tried to don't use on the floors the concrete, but there was no way. Maybe uh, if the second project they will do, they will find a way to don't use concrete, but of course it was a learning by doing. And, uh, but if you see another, so using the volume, we have already much better, so let's say 40%. But in the end, the most striking uh, diagram is the third one. So if we consider uh, the greenhouse gas emission produced from this building, and now we start to, to put this data on it because it's really one parameter that now is always on of the mouth of everyone, these greenhouse emissions. Uh, and we consider that 100% will be the same building, but new, with new materials. This will be 100%. And we see that this building actually produced just 40% and saves 60% of gray emissions, so saving almost 500 tons of uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And when we st you started, Marion says 17,000 per year? So, um, a million. Million? Oh, no, yes, yes, it's true. 70 yeah. million. 70 million. Yeah, so in the end, it's not so much, actually, just 500 <laughs> tons. But uh, yeah, this is the start point, let's say, this is the starting point. And this also, yeah, it makes understand how this uh, uh, reusing, uh, the topic of reuse building elements is really a niche, it's really a niche, but we have to, or at least, uh, uh, it's interesting to say that it's a niche, it's not maybe scalable right now, it's not economically feasible, but uh, actually, is one of the most effective way to really uh, save a greenhouse gas emission. And I will show you this on other um, uh, map, let's say, because also all the building elements uh, are coming from maximum 90 kilometers away, uh, from a radius of 90 kilometers away. So this means also reuse building elements uh, activate a local uh, process of uh, reevaluate re the local processes. We don't import any more material, but we invest in uh, creating new uh, process inside the, the country, let's say. Um, and, uh, and this uh, diagram shows also something else, how much more complex it is to work with reuse material, because if you, s if you see here, normally with an when we build a new building as an architect, we have one construction site. We start with a, let's say, white paper. Uh, white paper. We sketch uh, many different ways to do it, but you know there is going to be a construction site, and you know that you are going to define which kind of material you want to use. It's not so simple, and there are so many ways to do it. But uh, you know the source of it. But in this build, in, in this process, actually, there were more than 20 different demolition site, so, and uh, popping up in different moment during the process of uh, uh, planning this building. So the architect has to go to visit those demolition sites, understand if there are some interesting element to, that can be reused, catalog them, uh, understand if it's economically feasible to do it, organize the storage of them, and then bring it back to Winterthur. So, and for every, actually, for every building element, there is an uh, anecdote. There is a different way of doing it. And Balboro in situ can tell all of them. And, uh, and of course, as a researcher, uh, architecture researcher, 
we were also interested in something else. Uh, so we are also interested in the design process. What does it mean to design uh, uh, with this new process of reusing building elements? And we try to draw this, uh, let's say, a table, because, for example, Bauber in situ always says forms follow availability. So we just, uh, the forms comes out, uh, what, what we find at the moment. And it's not, um, and it's really like this, but we're in situ, I think they, they also do it in a radical way. And, um, uh, but it's also the way it is, because you just find the element, the, the building component in the moment that they are available. But we, as a researcher, we asked ourselves, is there another way? Or we wanted to understand precisely what happened during this building, during this building, this um, design process. And for example, we, we try to plot here, so the development of, of the building, of the, how from the beginning till the end, how the, the finding of new components influence the design process. And maybe the most striking uh, uh, example is the first one, is the steel structure. Because of course, uh, in Barbara in situ, in their pragmatic way, at the beginning they thought, okay, there is the, the, gr the, the ground floor of the building is a trapezo, let's say a trapezoidal shape. We would just create these three floors on top of it with the same shape. But then actually in Basel, in the depot of a uh, cope, Actually, this looks like an installation, a super crazy <laughs> art installation, but it's just was that during the demolishing of it, they were making holes in the, in the ceiling to put all the, the flat roof terrain uh, to make it, so uh, letting go down to then to take it away. But it looks really like an <laughs> art installation. But so they found out this structure that actually has the perfect raster that fit precisely to the ground floor of the building in winter too. But of course this raster is a, is a square, so it's a squared raster. And the, the other discussing with the engineer, they found out that the, they could really reuse the, the, the elements in the middle of the structure. And here you will see some images of the uh, disassembly of the, of the structure the catalogization of them, so because you have to put them in a, in a good way to transport them away. And here already an image of the, the structure uh, mounted, uh, remounted, reconfigured in, uh, in Winterthur. And as you can see from the last image, so th this building, got this volume got a cantilever element almost uh, as a, um, as a gift, so it was uh, um, as found. We can also put on top these terms in a, because it was not planned from the beginning. But uh, there are many anecdotes like this. Also the staircase, for example, uh, Bauburo in situ was planning to have an, a vertical connection inside the, the floor plan, but then uh, they found out this ter the ex exterior um, uh, fire escape, uh, steel staircase, in, a, in an office building in Zurich. And they just, it was working perfectly with the floors elevation, and so they just say, okay, we reuse it one to one, why not? And this is interesting, so this let me make a connection with this uh, uh, newspaper article, because uh, this is something, this is one of the main source of material for the project in, uh, in Winterthur for Baboro in situ. So an office building in Zurich that after less than 30 years, was demolished, demolished to leave space to two office towers. And this is really at the end, uh, yeah, the discussion, because uh, if you see this building, maybe we cannot like it uh, aesthetically, but this has a, a stone facade, stone tiles from in granite coming from Italy, three glazing uh, aluminum windows all around. Uh, it's a high value building that after 29 years were demolished. And uh, of course, because of many economical reason, in Zurich there is so much pressure, and uh, and this also this is also something really interesting to talk about because because of this economical pressure in Zurich there is a lot of demolition, and so we start to think about circular architecture and try to find a way to reuse the element, and maybe 
Okay, here in Milan is also happening something like this, but they are still building, uh, staying here for more than 60 years. So, so in the end, we are more sustainable here because there is less economical pressure than uh, in Switzerland. This also, this thought was something that, was, yeah, has always come to my mind. And uh, so this is other picture of the, uh, maybe, yeah, of the construction site. So the staircase coming to Winterthur. And this is again about these uh, uh, stone tiles. So uh, some workers, because of course in situ, to the first thought was, wow, amazing, super big uh, stone tiles. Let's take them, use them. We just take, yeah. this was again this uh, office in, uh, in Zurich, this uh, Orion office. And so, of course, here again is the question, we take away just the first row because it's much easier to take away. We cannot take all the other, the upper rows, it will cost too much. And here you can see also, they took the first two rows, but they left the, the pink one, because also then you have to decide, uh, maybe sh we should just take the gray one because we don't have infinite space as a storage, and maybe the gray stones are more easily to reuse than the pink one. So the, for every element, there is uh, a lot of uh, decision to be taken. And they thought, for example, that this was really economically amazing because we have huge uh, piece of um, stone tiles. In the end, it was really uh, one of the worst <laughs> decisions <laughs> because they were too big, too heavy, difficult to cut, but they still managed to reuse them. And, uh, and this is also really interesting as a design process from a, a facade, they became uh, a, um, a floor, yeah, for the balcony outside. And uh, then, for example, another point was this uh, aluminum uh, sheet, metal sheet, that come from uh, a building outside Winterthur, also an industrial building, and they wanted really this, uh, to use again this metal sheet, this orange metal sheet, also to have a kind of, uh, yeah, contrast, but also a connection with the industrial uh, context. Uh, this is also, actually, this is also a design uh, decision because they could have find also the other um, mm, metal sheet. And this maybe is the last one, other two workers dismounting the, the windows of Orion. In the end, they use 40 windows from Orion office in Winterthur. And this uh, photo helps me to introduce the work we are doing also in the university with the students because those are students of the master studio in Winterthur of the, in the Institute of Constructive uh, Design because uh, we established somehow that every time we, we do a master course uh, on the topic of uh, reuse building elements, one of the first exercise is always to, with Bauboro in situ, to go on a construction, uh, uh, actually a demolishing site, one day with the students and let them really dismount to understand how difficult uh, is to, to disassemble our windows, not breaking it. But, and uh, at the end of the day, the idea is always to make uh, almost an exhibition to place all the uh, dismounted stuff on the floor and to discuss really uh, how much economically feasible, feasible was this, how much time was uh, uh, needed to dismantle a door or uh, an electronic appliance or even an uh, isolation piece. And to understand, uh, also discussing within C2, because it's always a learning by doing. Can we manage to reuse those elements? Not. And this is something we do continuously, and this is a really interesting exercise. Um, and maybe this is a resume of what we, or the, the some courses we are doing. So mm, these are always master studio, master design studio. And uh, it just as a, so it was interesting because the first one was uh, we let the student design the same office building. So the same Aufstockung, uh, uh, the same um, three floors addition and the same plot as Barbaro in situ using the same catalogs of elements from them. And of course, it was much easier for the student than for in situ, but they, they was kind of successful. They w there was a lot of variety of different projects, different also aesthetics, it was really interesting to see. 
Then in another semester, in uh, fall semester 2019, we had another approach. We thought, uh, okay, let's try to go in another industrial area. We were cooperating with SBB in Zurich, in uh, Neugas Real. And uh, we, let this, we, could, we, say we let the student uh, design a primary school, but the idea was you should try to work and use all the building components that you find in the area. So uh, try to work also in C2. So, so we, we spent three days in this industrial real and we cataloged all the different elements. So we really try to uh, measure all the steel uh, pillars, the beams, wooden beams, uh, steel beams. And we create a three-dimensional catalog this was also was something interesting, so because the idea was also to work in somehow in a beam way, uh, try to have from the beginning provide the students with the. Uh, in the end, there were almost 200 elements, so um, that they could directly start to arrange in a three-dimensional way. It does help us because also we produce a nice exploded axonometry from the beginning, so they were already talking about the detail, and uh, where we yeah we were researching on also this. Uh, yeah, how to design with these elements. And another one then was more uh, now on a con conceptual level to say, this is something also Bobo Isito in, uh, is trying to organize to create a uh, hub for reusing element in the center of Switzerland, so a huge storage space, a huge infrastructure where almost, so uh, like a big Bautel Borse in Olten, of course, because Olten is considered like the, the center of the infrastructure of Switzerland. And um, yeah, so an app for reuse building elements. Uh, and last one, we had also smaller courses, for example, with a constructive research course, uh, we let the students develop their own lamp with reused uh, elements. And the nice thing was that one of the, the best projects was really used then in Kahn und Rachsen, uh, using this neon tube and uh, they all hanged now in the ground floor, in the entrance space. Or we also do further education. So we, we have professionals coming for two days and we basically gave them a course about re reuse of building elements and we, we do with them the same exercise we do with the students. We bring them in a demolition site and we let them understand uh, how it works. And the last thing is, uh, yeah, that is coming, is coming this uh, September. It's an international, international uh, summer school. And uh, we, we hope international student, third international student and international guest. And um, the idea is there is, uh, will be the, in a week, uh, we call it Palazzo Reus, because we wanted to, again, to the, uh, we want to discuss about the design uh, process, how to design with these reuse building elements. So that is in one week to let the students design and build physically a mock-up, a facade mock-up, one-to-one with reused building elements. They will find them all there. And the thing is also this facade should, should be for a prominent building, maybe a palazzo in the middle of the city. Uh, also because we would like to speak about the uh, yeah, uh, composition of a facade, the rhythm, uh, or how to assemble things together. Again, to questioning this form, follow, function idea of in situ, that is not, uh, uh, we don't consider it negative, it's just really we want to question this to understand what are the possibility with this reuse. And maybe it's going to be a big failure <laughs> this, uh, this summer school because in a week to produce a, a real one-to-one -one mock mockup. Uh, let's see, this uh, yeah, is going to be a challenge and uh, yeah, this was the, my last slide, thank you. Thank you very much, Guido, for this very interesting presentation. I also uh, thought it was interesting how you had developed the same thought that uh, Nicola said before, because we have consumerism, we are able to uh, reuse building elements, um, but it's a bit, uh, more difficult than uh, with your examples when you could find all the all the elements on the streets. So, 
when I read uh, the book Bauteile wiederverwenden, I was really amazed about uh, the reportage chapter, which I think it was called the chase for the for finding the goods. So for finding the structure beams and everything. And I see on your slide, uh, there is also Rotor, um, um, I think a Belgian yeah. architectural practice who has specialized on, on uh, finding material. And you also mentioned uh, the catalog. Seems to me, seems also to be an important element for, for a circular building. Yeah, actually, so in the end, it, it really goes down to this because to reuse building elements, you need to have, uh, to know the right information about the things you are going to reuse. And uh, so you need to produce a catalog of, uh, with all the important measures, with all the important information. And of course, a window, a catalog of a window looks different of a catalog of a beam, a steel beam. And that's why also, this was also a finding of this project, uh, it's much more easier to reuse steel because steel is a norm, uh, standardized product. You can find, you just have to get two measure of it and you know precisely which kind of IP, each AR, and you know the, the structural characteristic of it. You just need to understand the, the quality of the steel, but if you know that it was built 20 years ago, that should be no problem. And so uh, every building element is different, but of course, uh, uh, there are elements that works better for the reuse. And um, this topic about the, the catalog is the, the most important thing. There are many research about this because uh, there is also this con the concept of uh, urban mining to say, so actually as uh, the city, how was it in Rome in the end, uh, is actually a uh, a mine for the building of the future. We should uh, not uh, import any more new material from it, but reuse what we have. And, uh, but to do this, we, we should be able, for example, for this building outside there, to, to know precisely how it was built, all the elements, and to have a catalog of them. And there are many research about this, and it also goes in the this digitalization, for example. So the new building now are all they, are, they started to be planned with this beam technology. So you plan always a digital twin uh, of, the, of the existing building. So in the end, you will have the existing building and the digital twin of it, a three-dimensional digital twin. And when all the information are there saved, uh, maybe in the future when you are going to demolish it, maybe you can have already the catalog to reuse this building. But yeah, it's, uh, it becomes really technical and at the same time also really conceptual because, um, uh, yeah, in the end, what is really make uh, this, uh, uh, this process sustainable is that you can do it directly. You can find things in a demolition site and reuse them directly and save then gray energy. All the other strategy, so to this, yeah, to start to making catalogs or this design for this assembly or also this idea to say, let's do more timber construction. It's all good in terms of sustainability, but maybe it will affect the world in 20, 30, 40 years, but we actually need a solution now. Yeah, and you, uh, you also said a very important formula, form follow, follows availabil availability. Um, do we want that? Uh, what, what do you think? If we have to build uh, with what is available, would you like to reply, Nicola? Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's a main problem. It's a main problem of uh, what we can do, for example, for. In our case, in, 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 in Swiss Mountain, but it's the same in Italy, uh, uh, we estimate that we have got about 200,000 uh, greniers, that means uh, speicher. Yeah. Yeah. Utility buildings. We record, so there's a difference in four or five functional types. 
and do 100,000, it's, um, it's estimated uh, only using a, a part of territory, uh, count how many and try to statistically think, but no one of them could be reused functionally with uh, new habits. For more than one re reason, the building that you show that were uh, on the slide uh, were built and rebuilt maybe three or four times during the last 400 years. Uh, they came from the dimension of a tree. A dimension of the tree, it's four meter, no, it, it was six or seven meters long, and each time it's reused, the, the head of the beams are reshaped for make a new uh, uh, system of, um, of, uh, of, of link. And each time it re, re, uh, redefined, and nowadays uh, we, we have uh, a, a rate of five meters, and 80% of them are five meters, uh, with a one meter 50 of high each uh, uh, if she floor. Uh, the only way it's a to maybe to put together two different buildings to obtain uh, one meter 80, one meter 90, but it's not a low by the low. Um, typically, the, the, the functional building were built uh, to contain uh, in the season of wind a lot of, uh, of, of uh, granary, uh, of grain, and so the weight uh, uh, works really good, and nowadays are, 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 are void in, 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 in summer because no one uses as a as granary. So there is a lot of elements. For example, it's impossible to define any structural ratio because uh, our wood, it's not beam. We have no idea what happens inside wood. Mm -hmm. If we have dismantled, try to x-ray to check everything, maybe there are some uh, worms inside. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a nonsense. And, so it, and the problem is there. Uh, how can, what we can do? But this is, I think it's a side problem because we have got in the world 90% of building that maybe is not exactly as a granary on the Swiss Alps are, are, are building that, uh, that you have to decide what you want to do. Maybe we, we know, find answers in history. I mean, they, they, how, they, 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 they took what is available. And uh, you told us that uh, on the one hand, uh, they took building elements to... Um, to decorate uh, the new buildings with old historic symbols. On the other hand, it was also to, uh, for, for um, financial reasons, uh, work reasons. But maybe we, I mean, do you th see a way we could uh, translate form follows availability or how, how could you sweeten us this formula? <laughs> I brought also the, the term metabolization, <laughs> so maybe it's, a, uh, it's not so nice, but maybe we don't have to keep all the greniers, all of them, uh, for uh, the in, in, and bring them into the future. So maybe this wood could be used and metabolized in, in some other forms. So in a pizzeria. In a pizzeria. <laughs> no, I don't know. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's not very nice what I'm saying, but uh, if I look what, what Romans did, and uh, the marble was uh, very interesting also for, for getting uh, lime. Uh, and uh, uh, this was a business. And maybe they had more problem with the columns. They were everywhere, these granite columns. They were more or less standardized in, in the length, so they are closer to the <laughs> iron beams, maybe, or steel beams. And, uh, but they had too many, so, and some were broken, so they were not interesting anymore for, for use them in a, in a vertical um, construction, so they, they made slices and made the, the pavements of the Cosmati. Uh, <laughs> and the, the, w where you find the, this uh, porphyr and uh, serpentine, but sometimes also granite um, discs. So, yes, sometimes you have to take some de decisions and uh, leave some buildings go away. <laughs> A general question, and uh, try to define. We cannot impose to rebuild, to dismantle, and recycle. 
we can impose taxes, for example, for scrap, for dump, we can impose taxes for raw materials, and we can defiscalize a lot the labor. And that could be done, but, but uh, probably it's not in the, I'm not a politician, not an economist, but it's so easy, so clear, that if you, if you impose taxes for transport, you show exactly your, your system, uh, 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 it's complicated, but if you think about how are the cost of transport of an isolation system that came from Poland, built in Poland, it's mounted by specific uh, uh, hand worker that came from France, and, and, and in the difference of rebuilding of your building, uh, could be also competitive, your building. If the costs are not the cost of the of the worker of Poland, yeah, yeah. of the, the but actually they reused the insulation also. It was competitive because uh, to find it directly also is a is always about also the embodied uh, quality of the material inside, and also. Um, but I wanted to say also something else about this. Uh, the politics there are discussion in Zurich about this because, for example, why owner of a, such a building, a office building could demolish it after 29 years without also paying a tax somehow. Because if the building should, so this then became yeah, political and uh, so, but the, why not also in, yeah, impose a tax? Okay, the building should last at least six years because there are these rules. So every year that you demolish before, you should pay <laughs> taxes for it. And there are discussion about it. Um, yeah. Uh, maybe the present situation could also help us. When we look to history, we always found that if the material is scarce, if there is a shortage, if it's financially difficult, for example, during the oil crisis in the 70s, you use with what is here. So there was this ad hocism movement in the US and also in the German Democratic Republic, they built with what is there. They didn't, uh, couldn't go to the Baumarkt and, and buy uh, wood and, and uh, tiles and everything. So now that we have um, actually uh, with the pandemic and the Ukraine crisis, we have a material shortage and we have supply chains interrupted, maybe this could be a chance. What do you think? Well, could be a chance. I, I, I don't know, during the pandemic there was... Um, a very well-known statement of Bruno Latour that launched uh, this, uh, I think at my point of view, a totally egoist, selfish, and, uh, uh, and uh, Western-oriented uh, uh, statement of a uh, uh, global moratorium of building. Uh, at the nonsense, at my point of view, impose a, a moratorium of building, thinking that uh, uh, going to, 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 to my first intervention, uh, the, uh, not all the, the world, also in Western world or in Europe, uh, has the same level that we can impose this moratorium. Could be a provocation. I think that maybe it could be more realistic, more ethic and moral sustainable to asking a moratorium of destruction in terms of saying, okay, you cannot destroy at any cost, you, you cannot pay the structure. Because in Zurich, it's very difficult, because in Zurich, the cost of a construction are about 5,000 uh, euro for cubic meter. That means that maybe are 15,000 uh, francs or euro for square meter use, but the, the value is two times or three times. So in any case, you can build the luxury of the luxury of the luxury building and you gain money. And so you, you have to, probably you have to stop, so you have not to pay, not to do that. Uh, and then maybe intelligence came and you can find a way to, to recycle the use. So I, I'm not an economist, but I think that it's, uh, we must be more have more courage and, and in the meantime uh, try uh, to define that we, we, we have to build better not less, I think. How can we say stop construction, stop us? We need house, house, house. Yeah. I think the house, it's not a right, it's a, 
obligation for a democracy to give to all the citizens a shed. It, I think that the shed is not a right. I think that it's a hypocrisy of uh, our, uh, 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 um, of, uh, of nowadays. So it's not a right, I think that's an obligation. The only one constitution in Europe that has got this obligation is France. And it was uh, the problem of the saint papier uh, five or six years ago. The French government for the constitution has an obligation to give home. And so the moratorium of construction connected with this, uh, this very important question that came from the French Revolution. It's something that I think that it's really, really egoist. It's a bobo, a bourgeois uh, approach uh, to something that, okay, maybe you have got a better word, but we have got a moratorium of building. The Loi Weber, the Weber Act. It's, uh, that was uh, uh, instituted in 2015. It's an obligation, an interdiction to, interdiction, boom, of, to build uh, uh, second houses uh, yeah. in, uh, in, in Switzerland, not more than 20% uh, than, uh, of tourist houses in one. Mm -hmm. But that w what happens? Nothing of real important. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, safeguard of heritage, uh, what's happened that the, the inequity came uh, higher. Inequity of very rich people, sure but we can also learn from some parts of the world to understand if it's uh, developed in the other ones, what mm -hmm. happens. So no moratorium for building? Uh, the politic, politics should bring solutions? Um, so I think another point in Switzerland, I don't know how in Italy, uh, is the, the w how the wage of architects is, is me um, measured, right? Because it's part of the sum you build. And I think that would be also an approach to make it less attractive to um, build very costly. But is it is it uh, cheaper to uh, do a circular building or in, in, in money, in terms of money? <laughs> yeah, in the end we analyze also this and so there is also a graphic in the book and in the end it comes out to be, let's say, is all the same. But of course, uh, it's always difficult to calculate what is what would be a new building if you don't have it there. So, uh, but what happened is there is a shifting of uh, uh, of financing in this kind of uh, process because, for example, the owner, the, the, the Abendroth Foundation, they had to invest at the beginning of the project half, uh, half of a million of francs. Uh, to, to say, okay, we need this money to start to collect already the material. This is something that you invest uh, when you, you get the Baubewilligung, so you get the, the permit, the, the building permit, and then you start to invest. You start the construction site, or at least now you start the, the execution drawings, and then you, the owner, the, the, co <coughs> the client start to pay. And here they had to invest from the beginning, I, bigger amount of money. And this is also interesting because they have a pension fund, so they have the money. But maybe for a private person, it's not so easy. Those also was a shifting. And, but I, I wanted to answer, or not answer, but maybe comment on what you said, that you said in the end we should uh, build in a good way. <laughs> that uh, in the end, uh, be, sorry, in a better way. And this, of course, is the, I think it's always the answer because then everyone can interpret it himself <laughs> what is <laughs> better. But I have an example for because you were speaking about the uh, the Rasca, the Rascard in the uh, French part of Switzerland, and uh, uh, Nandini she was uh, speaking about this uh, metabolism, and uh, I, I thought about uh, this example of uh, the Rascard Garelli from uh, Molino in the Aosta uh, Tal uh, in the Aosta Valley. And because he moved uh, one rust card from one side of the valley to the other one and transformed it in a, in a private house from this Garelli family. And, but actually, he didn't do a precise one-to-one -one reuse. He interpreted a lot. So there was this kind of uh, uh, metabolism a bit in it because he didn't select, he didn't reuse precisely one-to-one -one of the w wooden element, but he reassembled them using his taste and his uh, knowledge, his culture, and even uh, creating a missing scene a bit in some moments of it. So this, is, for me, is a really yeah, a nice example of uh, 
building better. <laughs> yes, but this is an architecture yes. designed by an architect. Yes. I think no. that uh, we are speaking about one, uh, one thing that happens in 99% of architecture in the world. Reuse, rebuild, uh, repair, uh, um, bricolage, uh, It's, it, we can go also outside of Milan, and 19% uh, uh, of building uh, were maybe built by some geometra that ask a permission of construction in the 50s, and then are built and rebuilt and rebuilt and rebuilt, and after one sanatoria to another sanatoria to the, uh, what the name, indulto, no, what's a ca, ca, what? condono, it's a condono, it's another condono, second condono, condono of condono, uh, but it's, uh, it's exactly this approach. So we cannot approve or condemn this approach. I think that there are two different uh, question, questions. The first one is the quality, the second one is the quantity. And we, we can calculate quantitatively the cost of the architecture, as you did, and that it's, I think, that works. And then there is a quality that has have no, no, no way to, to define. I'm not at all interested by the architecture of the big architects. I don't know why I'm so. But I think that it's not a problem. Sure are not sustainable, not, 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 not. But how many are the, the architecture of uh, the, the grand manier? The, the, the main, not, not a lot. Uh, there are a lot in the history that we have to, to to maintain. I'm sorry, I'm looking at the time. Um, I would like to open to the public. Maybe someone has a question for our speakers. I can go around with the micro. Anyone? <laughs> it's your chance. <laughs> um, well, I have a, maybe a last question. We heard a lot uh, about uh, old solutions, bit optimism, new solutions. So overall, are you optimistic for our, how we, are, are our cities gonna look like? Are they gonna have a, an aesthetic face, uh, but are they gonna be sustainable? What do you think? Maybe just a short reply. I'm only sad, not pessimistic or optimistic, because each time I, I reach my, my mountain house, I found one house on the road that changes the window from old oak or what is castaño, I don't know in um, Castanian. Cheddar. Ch chestnut. <laughs> chestnut uh, 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 wood changed with a plastic uh, wood uh, mm -hmm. imitating the chestnut uh, and uh, I was with a student when I was in ETHZ in Romania to visit some uh, some mountain uh, villages and that was 2002 and then I come back in 2018 19 before the COVID and I visit the same village uh, there are refurbished by 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 hand worker by the, the, that came from uh, from Brianza from here and, and they reclad all the building of the wood building that were look like the building in, in, in Switzerland with also this champignon of, uh, of stone to avoid that rats come on. And they refurbished and completely isolated uh, and use a plastic window of a rosa color like this chair <laughs> that they copy in Brianza. And the people was very happy and they said, oh, you came from Italy, I would like to show you my, my Villetta. <laughs> and they use Villetta name. And, uh, and so I cannot say that uh, they, uh, during the communist, uh, so it's, it's a cynic to say we cannot say that. But uh, uh, I think that the vernacular condition, it's, uh, it's not a very happy condition. It was a condition of necessity. No one of the, uh, the men who lived on the Alps was very happy to live there. It's a, a romantic reconstruction that we did. This building were done following uh, natural laws and they prefer to come 
down on the valley and became from Paisan to proletarian, and so is the name, and became a proletarian with a, a very existence minimum flat and remained there of the window of, with the warming. Then uh, on the Alps, uh, looking uh, the same panorama of Heidi, but since it's, uh, it's something that we had to, to consider. Mm -hmm. We cannot impose uh, mm -hmm. everything what we, mm -hmm. we discussed this mm -hmm. evening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's important. Mm -hmm. Daniela, <laughs> some last words? <laughs> last words. Well, I, I think there is also this debate uh, in Switzerland, I think maybe also elsewhere about Baukultur. And this is something which is also, I am some, somehow skeptical if it really works. It's also some kind of elitarian and uh, maybe we hope too much that uh, it would work. But of course, if we could make, uh, the, bring to normal people with their villetta an understanding that uh, plastic fenster or plastic windows are not really an improvement and that uh, it might cost a little bit more to have uh, new um, or old uh, windows refurbished because we have also the standards for isol insulation that, uh, and isolation uh, which um, also ask from our, uh, our houses to be uh, klima friendly, friendly, climate friendly. So, uh, but maybe this uh, Baukultur discourse, discourse would help a little bit, at least in these, uh, how did you call them? This, uh, yes, class of new austerity who, 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 who can allow them to, to pay a little bit more. Yes, there we can do it. But uh, I think in Romania, Everybody who can buy new windows, even if they last only 10 years, they will do it. So uh, I'm not very <laughs> optimistic. Guido? It's difficult to answer, but I think there are so many dynamics for, for the cities, for the cities of the future, and but of course the the economical reason always the most uh, uh, important and difficult to fight. And um, yeah, I don't know how it looks like the city in the future. And, uh, and, and this, for example, this, this process of uh, reusing building elements is really a niche. So we say it already. And so I think you said 1%. Of the buildings? No, less. less, le less no, less. null and zero comma zero <laughs> zero. <laughs> yeah, in Italy actually it's really. And yeah, so mm, the thing is we have to understand if this niche is something that really can bring us forward. And now there is this huge topic of uh, greenhouse emissions and the uh, climate change. But of course, this, is this kind. So a war or a pandemic is something really physical and visible, and you can react directly on it. And so they, we found a way to make a vaccination in one and a half year. But this climate change is not so tangible. No one uh, uh, really think about it. So we, we are a bit like, no, but this sounds really pessimistic. I'm not actually, but, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so we have to find the good strategy and try to implement them, maybe in a political way or with the taxes, I don't know, but we have to keep in mind that the demographical push, push and the economical push is always the, the first one moving the world, as uh, Nicola said. So we have to keep in mind this. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Daniela, Nicola, Guido, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks for inviting us. Side, thank you for being with us tonight. Um, I'd like to invite you to a uh, aperitivo to join us for an aperitivo, and there you can finally talk Italian. And I'm sure our panelists will be glad to answer all your questions in Italian. 
Um, I'd also want to say that I left a flyer on the table when you go outside. It's an announcement of our next event on architecture, not in the framework of House of Switzerland, but um, in our location here in Milan. It's on hospital architecture. So for everybody who's interested, please take the flyer and um, you're very welcome and also spread the word. And thanks again for being with us. Have a nice evening.